Hey folks, it's another Compile Spirit video and podcast here. We're going to be talking about something that has always fascinated me and I need to wrap my head around, and I'm sure there's many developers out there as well today. So I've got Prakash with me today. Um, we're going to be talking about some no-code solutions, but also how that plays into the landscape for us as folks like myself, the older developers who are used to looking at lines of code. Uh, Prakash, if you would like to please introduce yourself. Yeah, absolutely. So my name is Prakash Chandran, and I am one of the co-founders and the CEO of Xeno.com. I'm really excited to be here. So thank you, Peter, so much for having me. Oh, no, thank you. This this was one of those when, when uh, your name came up in a recommendation. I was like, yes, yeah, I've got to have this conversation. <laughs> I can't think of anyone I'd, I'd rather have this conversation with. You know, looking over your background, having worked at Google and now going uh, as a founder of Xeno, I think that this is, this is going to be really good. Uh, We've got some uh, some questions here. My, my questions are uh, the me as a developer and worrying about my future and then realizing, oh, it's okay. <laughs> so that's, that's what we're going to do here. Now, uh, before we sort of dive into the specifics with Xeno, would you like to just cover for us kind of the, the, the landscape of where we are today with no code? Because we hear the term come around a lot. Oh, no yeah. code, no code. And, yeah. and what does that really mm -hmm. mean? And I, I think you're the perfect person to answer that question. Yeah, so no code, actually, the concept of no code, as you probably know, has been around actually for a really long time. You know, WYSIWYG editors, even back in the days of Dreamweaver or even before that, um, there has always been ways that people have tried to abstract away the complexities of traditional software development and uh, introduce them to more of the masses or make them more accessible. The issue or the stigma with no code uh, that still follows no code today is that it is highly limited, right? Like you can only do so much. You can only build your MVP with no code. But as we live in a world today where there's frankly, Peter, just not enough of you like traditional developers, there is an industry wide problem where there is just a shortage, right? Whether uh, engineers aren't available, they're not affordable or they're just focused on like core, bigger uh, product problems. And so Basically, there's been an evolution where more like product owners need to build software for themselves because they just can't get developers. So they turn to these no code tools that are limited and they, then they get stuck. So Xano, we like to say, is part of this, you know, next generation no code tooling that takes developer principles that is actually built by a seasoned developer uh, and makes them accessible to these new product owners that are trying to build software for themselves. I think like so many of these terms, Immediately when you hear no code, regardless of your background, the words themselves, right, imply, oh, oh, this is this is no code. This is yeah. just a thing that works. But it's a lot deeper than that. And I, I often think that for folks who are either looking to take advantage of no code applications or wondering what they are and, and how do I use those, it's important, I think, to always understand that the nice kind of layer on top that is this no code that you use in an, in an interface has absolutely incredible engineering underneath to make that happen. It's kind of that thing of behind the curtain, right? Yep. It looks easy to you because someone else has done the incredibly hard work. And, and this was one of the things you mentioned it here. Part of it is this, this feeling that, you know, no code applications they just don't scale well it's where you build this thing once it does its thing. That's its life cycle. But I know that you've taken a different approach to this. And I'm wondering if that was one of the core drivers for you with Xano was to look at this and say, Hey, if you're going to, you know, you have an application, it becomes successful. Maybe it's enterprise level and therefore you have to consider scaling. I, I know that you've got things like some Docker and Kubernetes in the background. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we kind of identified that there was this major hole in the no-code space where oftentimes a lot of these no-code tools were was like an internal tool, like an agency that people slap the CRM on. It's a traditional like, you know, multi-tenant uh, solution where a lot of people would come on. So if one person was like, you know, really using the product, uh, 
maybe too at a capacity that the owner did not anticipate, it would just diminish the product for everyone else. We knew that in order p- to be taken seriously and to kind of usher in the next generation of no-code building, we would have to kind of use the same principles that you know the best developers would do. So you know every paid plan basically is a single tenant, a uh, hundred dedicated resource uh, server. Uh, basically deployed with Docker, orchestrated with Kubernetes. It is on GCP to start. I'm former Google, uh, so is my uh, co-founder and CTO. However, you're able to uh, move that to your cloud if you prefer, or we even have on-prem deployments or in your own data center if you want. Why that's important is because when it comes to scalability, security, and compliance, you basically need to be able to move to the infrastructure that makes sense for the organization. And a lot of these other no-code tools don't allow you to do that. Um, The second piece of it is business logic fidelity. Like, for example, I'll take Zapier. Zapier is great, like to connect one service to another. But when there's no zap for the application you're trying to do, you're kind of dead in the water, right? So you need to... um, basically empower people to do more complex business logic transformations. And the only way to really do that is to give them 100% uh, fidelity of the things they want to do. When it comes to building application, and you know this, Peter, 99% isn't good enough. It's that last 1% that makes your software unique. So that's why we wanted on the infrastructure side, to be make something that was scalable, secure, and compliant and portable. And on the business logic side, make it to where you could build without constraint. I was reading through um, the, some of the documentation on the website. You know, a couple of things did stand out to me, and and you hit on two very important ones there. So I'll sort of try and break these down into two things. As someone who has worked on uh, enterprise applications, you know, like yourself, once there are some data sets and things like proprietary information for companies, where the security team they come to you and they say, "This is great." but it must never leave our firewall and therefore cannot exist outside our network somewhere else in the cloud. And then on the flip side, we have everything's moving to the cloud. So, you know, as you say, a lot of these other services, um, they're great, but it has to be on their hosting. So I love this idea of, you know, we have a solution, but you can take that solution, Mm -hmm. use it in-house, keep it in-house if you need to, you know, almost kind of make the security team happy, right? Right, get their you blessing. Have to. You have to. Yeah, yeah, you have to. Yeah, and you know, along with that as well, the importance of things like you know, uh, you mentioned the data, right? You yeah. know, there are so many rules, good rules these days for protecting users' privacy and their data, and having that extra barrier of keeping it in house where it's needed, and then if you have to, you know use it somewhere else and go out into the cloud. You've got that as an option, but it's in a very controlled way. And it's, you know, importantly controlled by you rather than, you know, you, you, we all do it, right? You check the box, you agree to some terms and some service. And then later on you find out, ah, actually if there's a problem and it leaks, it's on me. Yeah, you know, yep, so that, exactly. that's a very important thing. Yeah, the final piece that I was going to talk about was this business logic fidelity, and this is kind of where I would want to uh, bleed in a little bit into the importance of someone like you, who's a traditional developer, because you know this next generation of people that are building with these tools. Sure, they're able to build quickly on a tool like Xano. Um, However, they don't necessarily understand concepts like indexes or caching or things that make for scalable, uh, you know, performant applications. They don't understand the architecture in a way that you do. So we always said we wanted to be no code first, but developer friendly. Um, That's why we support things like Lambda functions, uh, sidecar Docker microservices, and ways for developers to have architectural supervision over the ways uh, uh, or kind of the innovation and empowering product owners to build what they need. This, this blends nicely into something else that I was going to mention that, that always makes me happy to see. Not only that you're embracing that that current ecosystem of you know developers and the, the sort of the the approach that we've been using, because we have to we have to look realistically and look at things and say, okay, you know, if we want to move forward and we want to move in and expand into other areas, be it no code or anywhere else, it has to work a lot of the time with existing infrastructure that we have, existing yeah. applications, uh, databases on the back end. And so I noticed that 
one of the key things that you have in there that you highlight that I think is, is worth talking about is this ability to, to essentially work with anything that has an API because me and a developer on a team and we've got a back end system that is, you know, let's, let's face it. We all know this, right? The bigger the company, the less likely you are to be up to date with the, the, the latest and greatest because, Hey, if it's in, in place and it works, it may be a few years out of date or something like that. But if I can then go to my developers and say, please write me an API so I can do, you know, X, Y, Z. And then that is the way to blend these two systems together. And, and, you know, that, that really stood out to me. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think you completely get it. I think we needed to basically, we made a very actually, um, hard decision it felt hard at the time but it was uh it was actually i believe the correct one to not abstract away the concept so that's why we call like for example we don't say zap we teach people about webhooks and apis we don't call them workflows or anything like that the reason why is because when you have new people that are trying to build and they run into uh, a roadblock if they don't understand how software works if they don't understand how apis work uh, authentication or anything like that, then they're really stuck. So we feel like, hey, let's treat everyone like they're grownups. Let's teach them about the principles of software development and let's empower them to build in the right way, using the right language in, in the way that current software development and software developers actually speak. Yeah, it, it almost feels, let's bring the education to it, mm -hmm. right, as we move forward. Company X comes in and says, hey, we've got this fantastic box, this magic box, right? Mm. And it's going to solve all your problems. And all you've got to do is completely rewrite your system to work with this box. Mm. And you know that immediately when you take that back and try to sell it to whoever it needs to be in a company, you're going to get the no, right? Yeah. Because there's, the, yeah, sorry, you know, yeah. years and years of data, we don't get to start again. Yeah. What we get to do is transition. And then maybe a few years from now, if we're lucky, we can say it's about time to turn off that legacy system, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, once it's transitioned through to this, this new approach, you know, and, and that again plays very nicely with the systems that you're describing where, you know, um, okay, it's now in your newer database. Um, it's either in the cloud or it's on, you know, your internal cloud, however you want to store that but it's now transitioned and you can work with it. And also, you know, my perception is that in a no code, um, more of a way of thinking than anything, it's a lot easier to take that and say, okay, you know, tomorrow we need to do this new thing with it. Mm -hmm. And it's a lot easier to step forward from there than to go back, you know, and look at the architecture diagrams and say, we just never coded it for this. Or yeah, we never saw that coming. And I think that's the other thing, you know, no code to me suggests lots of building blocks for today and tomorrow. And, you know, none of this, um, the architecture is what it is, we're stuck there. You know? Yeah, yeah, it, it en enables pe uh, people to move faster, for sure, right? It enables people to just uh, unblock themselves and and build something quickly, and uh, and then launch something quickly. I do still feel, and I think this is worth mentioning, that for larger organizations, you know, th there's a reason why there are architects and solutions engineers out there. Because when you build at that scale, they are actually required. So that's why, you know, you've probably heard of digital transformation, like a lot of companies, this was like the hot term, uh, really for the past five to 10 years. But really what it is, it's like continuous transformation. And we think that there is a world where even these larger enterprises, they need to be to work alongside these, let's call them citizen innovators uh, that are, are building and trying to unblock themselves. That's why we subscribe. There's a framework called Distributed Development written by Jack Morrow. We subscribe to this. And what this means is that in today's world, centralized IT, they're trying to move fast, but they're just kind of like, you know, they are just bogged down by their processes and stuff, which then causes the backlog. Uh, we need to give them architectural control over the citizen innovators that are building with these no code tools. So I think today's world shadow uh, or um, centralized IT looks at no code tools and they're like, no code, no way. That's shadow IT. I don't trust it. I'll never trust it. 
and I understand why they say this, but in this in in this new world that we're trying to basically really plant a flag and usher in is look, there's a way that we can work together. Centralized IT wants architectural supervision, and citizen innovators and developers want to build uh, quickly and launch quickly. So there should be a way to do this together, and that is um, why we subscribe to the distributed development model. Yeah, you know, something you hinted at there is you know speed. Right, We never have enough time to do everything we wanted exactly the way we want it to be. And something that I think conventional um, development approach has to stop and think about is, you know, the, the world we move in today is a lot quicker than it was yeah. when we had time to, to plan out these almost kind of monolithic code bases that are just going to work fantastic and they'll They'll run forever until you realize they won't. You know? mm -hmm. yeah. Speed to market has to be something that goes beyond things like marketing and, and product development and has to be a consideration for the development layer as well and realize that you could have the, the most beautifully designed uh, tool or service and you know it could be the absolute pinnacle answer to a problem. But if you never get it to market in time for the problem you're trying to solve, that's going to be an issue. And I think that that's where I find a lot of the time kind of almost in a, in a developer uh, advocate role, I always like to sort of preach that it's nice to make these things and be, hey, look how great we've architected this. But at the end of the day, don't lose sight of the fact that you are building a solution to a problem and it's really the solution that matters. Yeah. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, and funnily, I, I don't know that uh, all kind of de uh, developer, developer advocacy type uh, think in the way that you do. I think it's very forward thinking to understand like, look, there is a place for architectural supervision and uh, and putting in the work there. But we are living in a world where you have to ship quickly and you have to basically validate quickly. And sometimes you don't necessarily have the time uh, to do that. So I think that there is a world where we can operate together to where, hey, let's validate something quickly and then let's bring in an architect or a solutions engineer to make sure that if we deploy at scale, that there's good hygiene around that. Yeah, yeah. And I think this plays nicely into... Uh, you know, the other big topic of the day, uh, AI, right? Mm -hmm. You know, um, there's this, I don't know how accurate it is, but certainly this perception that, you know, all, you know, everything, AI is going to change everything and, and, and it's going to do away with all of these services and all of the people that, you know, maintain these things and AI is just going to solve the problem. And, you know, I, I'm not sure that I'm convinced. I'm convinced that I think AI can help solve mm -hmm. the problem or how you think about a problem. Yeah. So how do you, you know, how does something like no code and AI, um, you know, how do they play nicely together? Do you think that there's a role there for AI to help here? Oh, I, I definitely, th I think you said it best. It's, uh, it's, it's something uh, that can assist, but not something that can completely take over. You know, I think there's differing philosophies here, but I think the best way to say it is like, there is an intention and a nuance behind software creation that you just cannot get from AI, at least not today. So for example, if you said, build me an Uber type application, and I said, build me an Uber type application, like my intention of what that is, is very different than your intention. Like even, mm -hmm. even in like us talking back and forth, like sometimes I might say some, something with a different tone, you might interpret it differently. There's all this like compression and loss. So the machine isn't at a point where it can perfectly read what you're trying to say. So implicitly or inevitably, you have to go in there and then fine tune, right, where AI uh, basically left off. And that's the point. I think there might be a place where AI helps do like just the foundational work, right? Like, let's get like the baseline uh, done. But you're still going to need the human intention and the human interaction to build all of the nuance that is necessary uh, for production grade software. That's interesting. I was playing around with some some AI stuff recently. And um, I was still watching some other developers uh, and they were, you know, something as simple as, hey, 
Today, we're going to build a login system and we're going to ask AI how to code it. And we're just going to do exactly what it tells us. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing was, yes, absolutely. It solved the problem of the description of a login system. You yeah. know, I need an email field. I need a password and it's going to do this. But it did it in a very anemic kind of way. And, yeah. and I think, like you say, what, you know, it doesn't have, it, it can draw from all of the experience that it's got in its models from probably all the code and everything else that we've all put out there over the years. And that, that is fantastic, right? You've got this huge brain of millions of people making login screens, for example. Yeah. And, and that's great. It's going to know how to do it exactly the right way and, and, you know, follow your description, assuming you get the description right. But it's still going to, it'll be the same, you know, th the same as anybody else that's asked it to make a, a login system. Totally. It won't have the soul of a product. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. And, and like I said, I think for simple things, you can certainly build the foundation. And even for a login screen, you can build the foundation. But again, what is a login screen? What about OAuth? Oh, well, OAuth with what? What about two-factor authentication? Like, yeah. what about Magic Link? Like, there's like so many different layers to what people mean when they say log in or sign up. It's that uh, that it, unless you're like the perfect prompt engineer and you're perfectly able to describe all of the different scenarios and you then understand all the code that it spits back, which by the way, a lot of people don't. Um, you know, I just think that it, it it's not quite there yet. Um, now, look, it's an amazing innovation. I don't want to marginalize the impact it's going to have, but I certainly do not think that it's going to replace uh, your job or my job anytime soon. Yeah, it's funny how it goes full circle, right? Because as you say, a lot of people are just going to, you know, take that take, it's, it's almost the copy and paste syndrome, right? Mm -hmm, You're mm -hmm. gonna, it's going to take the code that it gives you, you're going to put that in. And if you don't understand it, you could be using huge uh, security flaws and things like that, that, like you say, even with, you know, like a no code where, where you rely on developers and architects to look at this and say, does this seem sound, right? Yeah. Uh, regardless of whether they wrote it or not, you're just asking the question, does this feel right for what we need? Yeah. And I do worry that that folks will interpret AI as, well, the machine's got to be smarter than me, so I should just use what it's telling me and not question it. Yeah. And so I do like that discussion. You know, again, like I say, full circle back to how this plays with no code and in, you know keeping the developers and the architects in the loop, even if it's just as a sanity check to say, wait, are we doing the right thing here? And, and did this get this right? And, you know, again, comes back to those APIs, right? Well, yes, if I've made my API correctly and I'm not exposing, you know, I'm not sending you plain text anything, um, yes, that's great and, and it's good and I can check that and we can QA this and, and run tests against it. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, in the same way, like if I was talking to someone in another language um, and I use the translation tool, I wouldn't just copy and, and paste it, especially if it was something important, like maybe for some things like I'm traveling and I want to get like the gist uh, across. But, you know, if I'm applying for a job or doing something more mission critical to my life, like I'm not I'm not going to rely on the copy and paste. And in, in the same way, it's software is very much the same. And I think you brought up an important point. There's also massive security implications when it comes to software. Yeah, yeah. And it, I think, you know, just to sort of finish off that discussion on AI, this, this came up recently in, in a talk with someone. It, they didn't stop and think when I was talking to them about, well, remember everything to put in whatever AI tool it may be, you've now added to that model. Yeah. So, you know, be cautious about what you put in there. If you get too specific yeah. and next thing you'll know, without even realizing it, you may be giving away proprietary. Absolutely. Uh, Most people don't something. realize that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then the next thing is like, well, well sorry, it's in there now. I know. <laughs> you know? I know. And, and maybe you'll be okay. Maybe you won't. So right. we do have to stop and think. Yeah. You know, I am talking to a machine and I can't just say to it, please forget that. And it yeah. will. Yeah. Um, very conscious of your time here. I'd like to, to move on and um, 
just to ask you about this because I'm always fascinated when I, I speak with folks who have worked at these, you know, huge companies that we all hold in high regard because of uh, they define a lot of the approaches that a lot of the rest of us take to things. So, you know, having worked at Google and then, um, you know, taking all the good practices that you've learned there and especially things like working with large teams, large products uh, and all the responsibility that comes with that. How has it been for you since you decided to move on and, you know, start Xano, I think team 2018? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. How has it been for you since then? There must be a lot that you learned there. There's like, okay, I'm now going to take this. And as we, we build Xano as a service and as a company, let's take these great practices. You want to talk about that? Yeah. So I think that um, I always encourage uh, everyone, like I do think that it's worth having like big company experience and it doesn't have to be a Google, but uh, it's just interesting to see, you know, the structure of things to understand the politics and the culture of how a big company operates. And I also think, especially from a uh, technical point of view, just to understand how these companies operate at scale, right? And uh, and work with just different teams and collaborators. Uh, Google was no different. I think Google, I, it was a very special time while I was there. I joined in, you know, 2004. I left in, you know, 2012. So I was there pre-IPO and then kind of just saw a lot of growth. Um, I think though that, and I always say this, like, you know, um, at a place like Google, like I was, for example, I worked on Google Calendar and, and then the enterprise product. When you're launching, you're launching to millions of people and you have Google's brand behind you. It kind of gives you like a little bit of a false narrative about yourself because you're like, oh my God, I'm amazing. Look at what the impact that I'm having. Uh, after I left Google because I had this entrepreneurial itch, it was a big wake, uh, awakening, you know, because I, I tried to basically just sell to one person, one customer, right, from the millions that I used to work with. And then everyone I wanted uh, to leave Google and come with me for my, my first startup, uh, you know, I didn't have childcare. I can't pay the same salary or do your laundry or anything like that. So no one came with me. So, you know, even though Google was an amazing experience, I, I really learned a lot. I made a lot of great relationships and understood how a big company works and kind of the cultural things, as I was mentioning, all of my real learning happened after Google, right? Going through my startup journey, going into consulting, and then finally uh, building Xano. And so, uh, you know, I, I would really say that uh, very grateful to Google, but I definitely learned the most about what it takes to be successful in business outside of Google. Fascinating. And I like it when I hear folks saying about how it's you immediately focus on on sort of the the everyday um, effect that it had on you as a person and those that you interact with more than it is um, you know about a company and yeah. and the fact that you know clearly what I'm getting here is that yes it's, it's about the, the, you know suddenly realizing you've got the responsibility not only to yourself but everybody else involved and you know, it's, it's one thing to, to worry about, okay, you know, the, what you're working on and when you're at a company and the teams that work for you. And then you, you, you sort of have that thing where you wake up one morning and, and it's like, oh, now I'm responsible for everything. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, even when you have, you know, co founders and partners and things like that, uh, at some point it, it becomes a, that, that level becomes a very small group. And, and I'm sure there are those days where you're like, I did, you know, we, we are doing the right thing. Right. And yeah. it's, it's interesting that you mentioned, um, that, that one customer, right. You know, we, so many folks I know, um, you know, that they, they focus on that, get the, the first customer and they'll do whatever they need to, to get that first customer. And then they stop and they're like, well, I've made it. I've got my, I've got my customer. And it's like, yeah, you need more than one customer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, sure. I, I know I, I've I've heard some stories in the past of people who I know who are fantastically talented. I mean, yeah. truly amazing. Um, and they 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 decided, okay, we're gonna we're gonna go do our own thing. And um, then over time, you know, they get that first customer. It works great. And then one day, that first customer goes away for whatever reason. Yeah. And suddenly they're like. 
always my next one. <laughs> it's like, that's why you should have more than one. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. And to the, not the, the military says one, uh, uh, one is none and two is one, you know, but I do think your approach is correct. When you are getting started, just focusing on one customer at a time is really the most important thing. And also, I think just being very honest with yourself around like, hey, like, why are they buying this from me? Are they buying it because um, they think it's very valuable and they think it's going to help them? Or they're buying it because they want me to go away because I've been pestering them for the past seven days <laughs> around like, hey, you need to buy this from me. So they just are, are paying paying me uh, to do that. So I, I think that it's, it's a journey, you know, when you're starting a business, it's hard. And I think, uh, you know, starting with that first and then to the second to the third and then just setting um, common sense milestones for yourself is, uh, is a way to do it. It's clear to me that, you know, I get that impression from the customers that, you know, you are very hands on, very uh, responsive, which is another thing as well is, you know, if if a customer needs something to, to open up and say, Okay, let's let's talk about that. You know, yeah. you, you may whether regardless of whether you think you can supply it or not, at least being open to that conversation as opposed to, you know, that that thing of, well, this is the product that I've got, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, I um I agree. And we we try to operate in that way. You know, I think that um the customers are the most important uh piece to what I mean, most businesses uh, do, it's the lifeblood. And so you have to listen to them and you have to kind of, yeah, sure, like we have a mission and a goal, um, but we're basically creating it together with our customers. Is there anything else that you, you'd like to bring up that we haven't covered? No, no, that's it. Uh, I really just appreciate you having me on and, and talking about this. It's been a great, uh, really natural conversation. So, so I really appreciate you doing this. Thank you. Yeah, I, I do. I love to have, you know, I always say with folks is I, I never like to do that, that question answer because you could do that with anybody, you know, yeah, for sure. it's kind of like we're saying with AI, it's like a machine could do that for you. <laughs> you yeah, know, yeah. the things. It's really about having that discussion of, you know, what makes, you know, both parties tick, right? What, what's that thing that drives them underneath? Um, so, so that's great. Yeah. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. You know, we're going to put links in the show notes for everything. You know, again, to please just tell folks where they can find you. Uh, we'll put links in the show notes for everybody. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, definitely check out Xano.com if you're interested in building, even if you want like a build a small prototype or microservice. Uh, we've got a great free plan that you can go and, and check out. Um, if you want to uh, follow us or communicate with us outside of or in the product, there's a great chat. Like we're really responsive. We're known for our uh, customer success and support. Uh, but you can also follow us on Twitter. And that's no code backend on uh, Twitter. Uh, also, if you're interested, a lot, a lot more people are on LinkedIn these days. We do have a LinkedIn presence, so uh, you can go there as well. But other than that, uh, yeah, that's it. That's been this been awesome. Great. Well, you know, uh, Prakash, thank you so much for joining me today. I, I really appreciate you taking the time. You know, I, I'm sure you're extremely busy, so I'm eternally grateful um, that, that you were, you know, happy and gracious enough to sit down with me today and talk about this. No, the pleasure, um, the pleasure is mine. It's nice talking to uh, someone that is tactical, but also just like understand all the nuances of software creation and also business strategy, the market. Uh, it's really been wonderful. So thank you so much, Peter. Thank you. I appreciate it. Go, go, go to Zeno.com and, and try it out. Um, I think you'd be pleasantly surprised that no code is a lot friendlier than, than most developers you know, may think. So yeah, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. And thank you to all developers out there. We need you. And no code is not trying to, at least I don't think no code is trying to replace anything. So, uh, so thank you for everything that you do developers. Yeah, although you know, we wouldn't mind if it helped us have longer vacations. <laughs> let let us let us take the monotonous <laughs> stuff, so you can do the hard stuff. That that's it. There you go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs>